In this series of episodes, I would like to relate to you the things that I saw, the things that I heard, and the things which I experienced. The purpose of these episodes is to acquaint you with the supernatural, and that's very essential, to acquaint you with the supernatural which God did in and through the ministry of William Branham and how God continues. That's what's very significant. How God continues to produce the supernatural through the ministry even to this present time, proving that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's the key, believing that this Jesus Christ, who spoke and who was recorded in the, in the Bible, and that Jesus of the Old Testament, or God of the Old Testament is Jesus of the New, and we have the Holy Spirit today. It's the same God in all of those uh, events. And it shall come to pass, the scripture says, if they will not believe thee, God speaking to Moses, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And if the supernatural doesn't have a voice that follows it, a voice that reveals Jesus Christ to the people. But ye shall see me who, the believers, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Is that true? Then it's sin to disbelieve, strictly a stranger to me. You're from away from here. You come from another city. You've got a lot of trouble on your heart. You got hard trouble to begin with. Is that right? There's a whole lot of blackness. I see a black sheep keep following you like that. Oh, it's a lie. Somebody told a lie on you. And that was a man was professing divine healing. Yes, sir. He said you was a witch. Yes. Is that true? And it, you've got a whole stir in your church or something other about it. Isn't that right? Your pastor's sick right now. He's got polio. Is that right? Yes. Sister, don't pay no attention to what them people tell you. They're a lie. And the only thing's wrong with your heart, that nervous condition got your heart worked up. Go on home in peace, and God bless you. You're all God who has created the heavens and earth. I ask now that every demon power in this building will be broke. The power of Jesus Christ be made manifest. Lord, weak, but we're not defeated. Satan, I adjure thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come out of the people. Stand up, you crippled people, out of the wheelchair. In Psalms, God spoke through David and he said, Lo, he doth send his voice, and that a mighty voice. Jesus, when he came, and there was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That just couldn't be clearer. My sheep know my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And then speaking of the voice that would come in this last time, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared it to his servants the prophets. And we say, what is this mystery? It is so that the voice will be in the bride. So the prophet of God has said, God raised up others. And so it has gone on through the years until this last day, there is again another people in the land who under their messenger, will be the final voice to the final age. And we can quote the words of Jesus when he said, 
It is not you that speak, but the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And if all believers of this message would take those words that I've just spoken concerning, it's always been the voice revealing the Almighty God to us. And to realize it's not just something that we heard and we received. This is what has connected the same Bible. I don't read another Bible, but the same Bible has just become alive. And the opening of the Word, the opening of the Scriptures, things that we could not see or understand have become so clear. And this is our great ambition to make this known. And furthermore, I would like to advise anyone, regardless of what you have heard, uh, regardless of what you have heard, positive or negative, I can tell you that I would recommend to you to do the same thing that I did. If the angel of the Lord was at the platform, and I am a witness of these things, I was there, I saw it on the platform. I saw it as the prophet of God spoke to the people. And I knew the people. Some of them were from my church. And I knew that the angel of the Lord would not use a human vessel to speak things that were not true. It had to be absolutely true. And God is a God of truth. And it speaks of Jesus Christ. He was full of truth and grace. And I can say that in the revealing of himself, it was absolutely true. Until you have somebody that can stand in the public year after year after year for many years and reveal the secret of the heart, only God can do that. Tell where the people were. Tell them where they were standing. Tell them what they're suffering with. Tell them whether they'll live or they'll die. I mean, that kind, of a, that kind of a voice is the voice that I want to hear and follow, and that's the voice that a person will hear long after this life is over. That's the voice. That's the voice of Almighty God. And I can tell you that that is what I experienced. And it is true. One day, my father, he was about 18 at the time, and he was plowing a field uh, in Saskatchewan. He was plowing behind the horses in the furrow, and he was walking in the fresh furrow, and he doesn't know what happened, but it was, he said it was like a wind. I would say like a forest, like I experienced with in Brother Branham's ministry, but this force struck him 
and he fell to his knees in, in the fresh furrow and he threw up his hands to God and he prayed and he cried out. He said, oh God, if there is a God, now he's an older boy in the church, but he cried out, oh God, if there is a God, if you ever show me how I can be free from my guilt, my sin, I'll accept you that very day. My father farmed for a short time near his father's farm and it wasn't working out. He didn't feel cut out to farm. So they moved, he and his young wife and young family, I was only about two years old, and they moved up to a small village, only about 150 people, I think, a village called White Fox, Saskatchewan. And uh, it was there, I'll just make this a little more brief, but it was there that my father encountered a family with two daughters, with two girls. He had seen these girls walk across the street, a little gravel street in the town, and he saw in their faces they looked just like angels. He thought, oh my, if I could only have what they have. So there was a craving in his heart for reality, for deliverance from sin and unbelief and so on. And uh, he wanted something more than religion, of course. A lady in the town heard that he could do some carpenter work. So she would needed some shelving or cupboards in her kitchen and had him come over and look at what she wanted done. When he was in the house, he noticed there's the two girls. And as he was getting ready to go, the lady asked him if he had ever been saved. And he said, well, I don't know what that means. She said, that means you can be free from your sin. Oh, he said, if I could only be free from my sin. She said, well, we are having meetings in a home on Sunday, if you'd care to come. And she, and he said, I had promised God years ago, if I ever could be free from my guilt, I would accept it that very day. And as I understand the account, she just, they knelt at two chairs in that kitchen of that home where those two girls were. And my father was, he got up a totally transformed person. He lived for Christ all of his life. And he had, matter of fact, it was then my mother passed away suddenly when I was only six and a half years old. I was in grade two at school and a very godly man. I think he was probably an old farmer, but he was a very godly man. And I was called out of the room and my sister was standing with him. And he said that, uh, Jesus had taken my mother to heaven. And this was, this was the beginning and the end of many things. It was, it's a very, very difficult and very sad story. My sister and I, we went through from one housekeeper to another to another, about four different housekeepers. And we had time we were alone and my father was working in an alfalfa plant cleaning uh, the bags and so on. And we would try to make something to eat and go up there. And then my father heard of a lot of work that was taking place in Dawson Creek and the building of the Alaskan Highway. Just prior to that, my father had remarried a very fine Christian woman, but she was completely opposite of what my mother. My mother was a very uh, a very loving mother. Um, and uh, not that this one wasn't, but we weren't her children. And uh, she was very quiet. My mother was outgoing and very, you know, uh, just very outgoing. And this woman was, Anna Leland was her name, and she was just a very, 
quiet woman. So anyhow, our life was completely rearranged. And my father went over about a thousand miles west to Dawson Creek and up the Alaskan Highway. He was, there were camps built all over the highway. And you have to understand that the Alaskan Highway was a war project. The Japanese were invading up the Aleutian Islands, had already taken over two of the islands. And there's even, I understand there's documentaries where the Japanese had taken Attu, A-T-T-U, Attu Island. And that was the thrust. If they took Alaska, and then Northern Canada was really not defended, and then if they got down to the 48 states, it would, it would uh, uh, risk. Japan was fighting and they had seized much of Asia and now into China as well. Singapore and Hong Kong, and they'd taken all of that. And now if they took, they were a powerful force and uh, if they came down to the 48 states of mainland uh, America. So Canada and the United States joined together and the U US built the highway and Canada agreed to maintain it forever. And then there would be a land route to get heavy equipment, tanks and war equipment into Alaska to defend it. That's the purpose of the Alaskan Highway. And there were tens of thousands of people and contractors and civilians that were involved in that. And so my father moved up there and he was at mile 458. He wrote back and communicated with my stepmother to pack everything up and to come out. And we arrived in Dawson Creek at the end of May uh, I won't say perhaps the 1st of May because my sister, whose birthday is May the 6th, she had her birthday on the train coming from Edmonton to into Dawson Creek. And while we were there, uh, this has all happened in, you know, after my mother passed away, everything is just in a turmoil. Everything fell apart. And then I found myself, I was sent out to a farm 45 miles out of town, across the mighty Peace River, uh, with a tugboat and a little ferry, and to people that I didn't know. And my, the last string I had on earth was my sister, and she was, she was taken to a place, uh, and because the pastor's wife had been arranged to find a place for the two children, and my mother already had work up the Alaskan Highway. So I didn't have a mother, I didn't have a stepmother, I didn't have a sister, and one is sent one place, one is sent another place, and I was shifted. I never had a home all my, all my youth and growing up years. I never had my own room, never had my own bed, and I moved 17 times uh, from then until the time I was 15. So it was a, it's a difficult time of, of my life, but I've been asked what prepared you for the mission work and for this gospel. It was those years. I learned the, what the wilderness was. Little did I realize that years later I would have God's prophet up there and he loved that area, and it was wilderness, and that's all I knew, really. So, uh, my father then, in 1949, he felt to move to southern British Columbia, and on the way down, he would stop, because he, he had such an experience with God, and was interested in anything that God was doing. In fact, his, 
He stopped in the meetings and he had heard that William Branham was going to be in Vernon, British Columbia. And that is where my contact began with him. Uh, in fact is, I have a letter. I should perhaps just read this letter. Uh, just a portion of this is my father's account of the meetings in Vernon. We found this, I think, after my father passed away in his things. And he's writing a minister, and he's writing about the news of our beloved brother Branham passing away. He said, came as a, with a shocking surprise to me, the loss of him cannot be estimated in words. Now he is resting in peace, but his work is going on and his memory is cherished in the hearts of thousands in the world. But he was writing about the meeting in Vernon, British Columbia. That was my first time. Finally, he said, Brother Branham looked at a poorly clad mother with a crippled child in her arms. He asked that the way be made for this poor mother to come forward. Never had I ever seen such a bundle of twisted bones. Thought this was a totally impossible case. Brother Branham took the child in his arms and lifted it up for the people to see it. There were tears and moans and sobs heard all around the place. Then he said, people, do you see how the demons have twisted the whole body of this child and are holding it bound? I will not let this child go until all these demons are cast out and the child is perfectly whole with great authority he commanded the demons to come, to come out of out in Jesus' name. After several commands, the demons came out, and before the eyes of that great crowd, the bones were made straight. His arms, legs, neck, and back all became straight, and the child lifted himself up with a smile on its face you should have heard the, uh, the, the arena or the arena ring with the praises of thousands as they saw the mighty miracles of God done in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God forever. Now that's my father's unsolicited, but he did not know what was happening to me. I was just with a series of young fellows. That's where I first met Billy Paul, in fact. And we were in our teens. And uh, I, was, I was caught by this, that Brother Branham was a man that had talked to an angel. And an angel had come to him and told him he would take a ministry of healing. Now, I was familiar with Sunday school, with church. I knew the Bible spoke of angels. I had never, ever laid eyes on a person who had talked to God in that way, talked to an angel of God. And so I was anxious to see him come out, and he came out, said, good evening, people, good evening, friends. And he began to speak. And after two or three days, I felt, I've got to get down where I can see this. I'm, I'm, I had no interest in being up in the, high in the bleachers anymore. I didn't have any more interest in just being with the fellows. And I got a seat. I don't know how to this day. I got a seat right on the aisle, one chair, just close, two or three rows from the front. And in that service, I can't tell you what was spoken. I can't tell you of anyone else. But there was a girl, and I would say the girl was 
probably around 10 to 12 years old. She had ringlets down to her shoulders and uh, kind of a full-faced girl, but her eyes were just white balls. And I noticed right up, I was that close to the platform. I, I just right in the corner of the eye, I see just a little uh, part, a little part of the ball, the ball of the eye, the edge of the eye. And the other eye, I could see nothing, just white. And I was, as far as I was concerned, and, and she was totally blind. Brother Branham laid his hands on her and he prayed a prayer. And I thought, in my young heart, I thought, well, I've heard about, you know, these things. Now, now here's something I can actually see. I can see this. And I was anxious to see someone healed because I had had so many experiences in churches and so on where people were prayed for for internal sicknesses and you're healed, but now it was something I could see visibly. And uh, Brother Branham prayed the second time and she was the same and he prayed the third time, fourth time, fifth time, and he'd keep looking at her and she was the same. Brother Branham prayed six times and he did something I have never, and prayed a prayer I've never heard before. And he, he took and put his arms around her like that and just kind of held her to his bosom. And he said, Satan, an angel from God had delivered this gift to me and told me that nothing would stand before my prayers, not even cancer. If I could get the people to believe, he said, the people are here and they believe and I charge you in the name of the living God to loose her and let her go. And that time he did not look at her anymore. He just turned her, took her by the shoulders and turned her to the audience. And I was just two, three rows away. I, I think I was in the third row. And I looked up and her eyes were as straight as mine. And then he lifted her up like this and the cries of the people. I didn't know that my mother and dad or my stepmother and, and dad were in the, where they were in the building. But that was my experience. This was my father's experience. And, uh, and I, I could even see the tears form in her eyes as she looked at the bright lights. She wasn't accustomed to the bright lights. And she looking at the bright lights, and. Uh, and then he put her down, and, and that anchored in my heart at 14 years old.
there was a time of my life I was separated from everything, including the young lady that I thought I might marry. I didn't know, but I was, God, it was about eight months long. And during that eight months, I had a very, very unusual uh, walk with God, I guess, I would say. Very unusual. I had a room, and I worked in a store right below. And the Hudson's Bay had bought out my father-in-law. Uh, he, he became my father-in-law, but he was just the owner. And uh, I, I was working in the, uh, I was manager of the produce department. And uh, when, when the noon time came, I would go up to my room and give the first half hour of my lunch time in prayer. And uh, it was just something very special. It isn't something that I ad advise others or admonish them. It was just something that I just did. I, I longed for it. I craved for it. I even, you know, would pinch in the moments so that I could be longer there. And I would slide out the other chair for the Lord Jesus to sit on and be there. And uh, when, when the work was over, I would sometimes go out and walk in the woods or walk in the, around the creek and just look at the flowers or something and just be overwhelmed at the beauty of it and weep. And so, so that was the kind of experience we had. And then God was moving in such a way that denominations was nothing. It was the people. You know, if there was a hunger and a desire for God, and we under we heard that there was a meeting, or I had heard that there was a meeting taking place in northern Alberta. And it was about 300, 350 miles from where we were. And I waited till when work was over on Friday, and then I took off on my motorcycle. That was the only, tra uh, only transportation I had. And it was cold, and I was suffering from hypothermia. I didn't know it, but I was. And I uh, went till about two o'clock in the morning, and then I would see a farm light flicker, you know, way in the distance, and I thought, oh my goodness. I always was so bashful to do that. And then there was one right beside the road, a whole log house, and so I pulled in there real quick. It was in the middle of the night, and a light was on, and I leaned my bike up against the log house, and uh, I tapped on the door, and I just heard some voice inside, come on in. So I opened the door and there was a guy with his feet up on a table reading a book. And uh, so I said, well, I, I said, I was just pulling up and I was very cold and I was almost freezing to death. And oh, he said, yeah. I said, I thought maybe I could bunk here for the night. Yeah, he, he said, you can have a room here. And he was a bachelor, made a big breakfast in the morning. And then I set off the next day and it had snowed that night. And so, in the afternoon, then the sun was coming out and people were splashing, you know, spraying me with wet snow and water and so on. But I did that to get to a meeting. And uh, it was in that meeting that, you know, God confirmed that uh, God had given me the young woman who was my wife to be my wife. And uh, I was feeling uh, a call, I guess. And I can't identify what the call was. Uh, I think it evolved into, uh, you know, when I uh, began to speak to my wife and uh, we were actually riding in a car, and then I'll go back. And I said, well, I wanted her to know I would not be able to give her the kind of life that she knew and that she's experienced and that she's had 
with her father being a businessman and being in business and so on. I said, I can't give you that kind of life. I said, I've been called to preach. And that's probably the first time I said that to her. I've been called to preach. So I think that now in retrospect, I was, I was feeling that pull. I, I, I didn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the example of someone behind the pulpit and someone preaching, but it was just uh, a, a deep hunger for greater things of God and the life that God had for you and what there was, you know, uh, available. And uh, so I was actually prostrate on the bed and I was in great sobs, of, you know, just exposing my soul to God and I didn't know what to do. I remember taking off my watch and I put it on the bed and I took my billfold out and I put those on the bed and I just surrendered it to God. I said, my time and what he put in my hands was uh, going to be his. And uh, I, can't, I can't describe any special uh, extended thing from that, but I think God sees that and then he just sets your life in a certain course and allows certain things to happen and, and he, he knows that blessings are not going to upset you or they're not going to drive you in a wrong direction. You, you handle that. You, and then you, you become uh, a trustworthy uh, steward of the things of the kingdom of God. God has to have people that can handle funds, can handle business. The gospel itself is not is not something that is uh, uh, conducted on, you know. God can take little, but he, and he can take much. So, yeah, I just, it was something I experienced, and that was before we were married. I was pastoring, been pastoring three and a half years, and I was kind of filled with, I won't say disillusionment, but it was. We didn't know, you know, I had good friends that were Trinitarians and good friends which were Jesus only, and we didn't seem to put a lot of importance to it because no one could answer it. And uh, then I had heard that you know, Brother Branham was 
now speaking some things and I had huge, huge questions about it. But one day, just one day, one meeting, I happened to have my friend Bud Southwick and he always stayed in our house in Dawson Creek. And A.W. Rasmussen, who used to pastor in Edmonton, and then he pastored in Tacoma. And he was a very, very dear friend of um, brother from Chicago. And that whole community was a very close community. And so he said to me, he was in my home that one time, just once. And Brother Rasmussen said, Brother Eddie, why don't you write Brother Branham and invite him to go on a hunt? He said, you know, perhaps then you could have some meetings as well. He said, he loves to hunt, you know. And so that was just enough to nudge me forward. And I wrote Brother Branham. I, I remember writing him a letter. And while I wrote the letter, my mind was telling me, you'll never hear from him. He probably gets 100,000 letters a month. And I thought, well, this is, this just doesn't make sense. Anyway, I wrote and I posted the letter in Dawson Creek. And right after that, I had resigned the church and came down here to the west coast of British Columbia, about 800 miles south, and started to minister to the native Indian people. And about three weeks later, I got a, a phone call, a letter, from Brother Branham, saying that he'd like to go on a hunt, and perhaps we could have some meetings in Grand Prairie and Dawson Creek. Thus, that tied those meetings in. We arranged those meetings and, and I had all these questions about the ministry, about the absolute, uh, is, there, is there some definitive absolute on the Godhead and on the baptism? And oh my, how the word opened up then. And I, uh, so that's why when I was on the platform and I say, to you, I was there. And I found that what he spoke was the truth. But yet my heart had some big questions in it. But I, I see the soldier boy is called out. And Sister Clondis, people from my church are called out. And he relates exactly things that I know are taking place in their homes. And here, now I'm with him and driving up the Alaskan Highway to the hunting territory. And this is where everything changed. Because I was, one day, I, I, I actually went on the hunting trip to keep the cost down, I was doing the cooking. And uh, so one, one of the evenings, Brother Branham just said, I think I'll just go out and maybe get a rabbit or something for camp meat. And he said, would you like to come, Brother Eddie? I said, yes, I would like to come. And Brother Chris Berg, who was a dear friend of Brother Branham's, he said, ah, yeah, maybe I'll come too. Sure, Brother Branham said, why don't you come, Brother Chris? No, he said, I'm going to stay and do the dishes. He said, you go, Brother Eddie. We were camping. So we walk along, Brother Branham and I, on a path. I walk a short distance. And uh, I could see he wasn't really interested in, it was a beautiful evening. He wasn't interested in hunting. I wasn't in, at all interested. And he walked over and a short distance and just sat on a big log and I sat right beside him and our knees were almost touching and uh, so I, I wanted to ask a question you have to listen very closely now 
I was curious why all this manifestation, which was so powerful and so real, and how the basic element of it could deteriorate. And I just, I couldn't understand it. And that's why I was so disillusioned. I thought, something's wrong, something's wrong. So I said to Brother Branham, I said, how is it that people can prophesy, they can speak in tongues, they can interpret, operate the gift of the Spirit, can preach and they become so anointed. And I said, I know what the anointing is. And Brother Branham said, have you heard my service on false anointed ones? And I kind of dropped my head because I had not heard a lot of tapes. And I said, oh no, I'm, I haven't heard that. You know what the strange thing was? Brother Branham hadn't preached that for five years yet. It was five years later that he would preach that service, false anointed ones. But he said to me, he said, now the wheat and the tares grow in the same field. He said, you tell me what the wheat rejoiced in and I'll tell you what the tares rejoiced in. And I said, yeah, I still wasn't getting it. He said, in the last days, Peter said, in the last days, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And he asked me about all. And I said, all flesh. He said, A-L-L. -L. But he said, not all flesh is saved. I said, yeah, I was beginning to see that there was, there was a point here that he was making, yeah. And then when he got to the wheat and the tares, I began to see. And then he said, you know, like my sheep hear my voice. Not, not all my sheep, not all are my sheep. And I begin to see, uh, yeah, there was something I really, he said, they're anointed. They're genuinely anointed, but the wrong seed. And I begin to see that that's clearly taught in the scriptures. I would like to say to the people who hear this, I met the master. I didn't meet just William Branham, him I knew, but I met the master, the God that he served. And he said, I was riding on my horse this afternoon behind Brother Bud and the sun was warm. And I believe he said that you have three questions you want to ask me it was exactly the truth. My heart was just completely exposed. He said the first one is on baptism. And he took them in the order they were in my heart. And the serpent seed I didn't even want to discuss. But he said the first one is the baptism, the second one is the Godhead, and the third one is the ser serpent seed. And I knew that if he avoided the scripture, or you know, just avoided that scripture, I knew the word of God was the absolute, but I didn't understand it. And when he said the serpent seed, I said, but Brother Branham, I was so wound up. I, ra I raised my finger, not in his disrespect, I just raised my finger, I said, but the scripture says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. Call his name Cain, for I've received a man from the Lord. He said, of course it's from the Lord. All life comes from God. Doesn't matter whether it's a right relationship or a wrong relationship, all life comes from God. And I said, yeah. He said, but you need to read the next verse. I didn't know what the next verse was. And she again bare his brother Abel. He said they were twins. That's when I knew I'd missed something. They were twins. He said they've always been twins. Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, 
Jacob and Esau. He said at, at Calvary, there wasn't three that died, it was four. Well, that was new. And he had his hand up like that. He said, Jesus and Judas. Jesus and one thief and Judas and the other thief. And he went like that. And he said, they each took one his way. Jesus took one thief to heaven and Judas, the son of perdition, took one his way. And then I realized that he said, then there were Antichrist and Christ, Christ and Antichrist. Every, every revival bears twins. And I could understand what was happening and what I was disillusioned about. I knew one thing, that my heart had been exposed. And I was like naked before God. And uh, there was nothing hidden with God. And that's the way it was with the people on the platform. That's why he asked, not hundreds, thousands and thousands. Is that true? Is that true? It was always true. Not one time in all of the lives, in all of the years of ministry, not one time did anyone say, no, that's not true. It was always true. And that's why it was the spirit of truth. And that was the spirit of truth coming to me and I can say that all my questions were answered and have been answered by the Word ever since. And that is the truth. And one thing I can say, I met him on the log. I met the God that the woman at the well met, the same Lord Jesus. And wonderful. This account is regarding a soldier boy and uh, knowing that I had raised, I'd been raised in quite a few of the army camps, U.S. Army camps, during the building of the Alaskan Highway. Now, this was 1961, so I had not seen a U.S. Army uniform but I, 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 in the foyer of the church, or it wasn't the church, it was the church hall in Dawson Creek, United Church Hall in Dawson Creek. And I, I looked through the people and I could see a staff sergeant on a tunic. And so that caught my attention. I thought, that's nice to see, you know. And then I didn't see it anymore. Then while we're in the service, we've come to the end of the service, it is Saturday evening, uh, and Brother Branham has preached the service from that time. 
And we've come to the end of the service and he begins to sing, the whole congregation begin to sing, I love him, I love him. And right in the midst of that course, at the first end of the course. What's the matter, soldier boy? You're not going to commit suicide. The devil's lying to you, boy. You've only got a phobia. He's lying to you. He'll drive you insane if you believe him. Deny him. Renounce the devil. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to renounce the devil and accept Jesus Christ as your healer. You'll go back and be a gentleman and a real, real man. Do you do it? Raise up your hands to God and say, praise God. That's right. Oh, amen. Now go back home and be well. All that believe him, raise your hands and give him praise. The amazing thing is, I was there. I was on the platform. And so I immediately thought of this, this tunic that I had seen. And, and young people were buying, you know, army uniforms and uh, tunics and so on, just wearing it as jackets. So I didn't know but what it was that. And uh, so I began to look for a soldier boy and others were looking also. There were also some Canadian uh, soldiers that had been attending the meeting. One of them became a very, very firm believer and uh, we couldn't see any soldier boy at all. And when Brother Branham continues to talk to him and says, you'll go home and be a real gentleman and be a real man. Deny the devil, deny him. And so it was a, it was a startling moment, really. And the next day we were leaving, or the following day, we were leaving early in the morning on Monday morning. Brother Branham did not know where we were taking him. I was just taking him up the Alaskan Highway and we were going to go about 375, 400 miles. So we drove as far as Fort Nelson, which is mile 300. And I said to Brother Branham, I said, you know, maybe, by, maybe we should have a bite to eat because by the time we get up to Brother Southwake's place, which will be mile 375 at that time, I said, you know, Sister Lila will probably be done her dishes at Sister Southwake. And he said, I think that's a good idea. So we just pulled off on an access road on the left side and stopped at a little, little stopping place. It was like a little hotel. When the U.S. Army pushed the highway through, Do through Fort uh, Dawson Creek and then Fort St. John, they passed the town and then the service stations, etc., built alongside of the road. And so we stopped in there where there was a restaurant, just a little clapboard building, probably two stories. And uh, we're having our, uh, we're gonna have our lunch. Brother Chris Berg was with us. There was Brother Chris Berg, Brother Branham, and myself. And we sat in a booth. The waitress had come and taken our order. And just after that, the door opened, which was on the side of the building, and in came two men. And I recognized as one as being the soldier boy that I'd seen in the tunic unit, the tu tunic uniform, I should say. And uh, I, when I looked at him, I said, well, fancy seeing you here. I had been away from this area for about a year and a half. And Brother Branham, he just looked up over his shoulder like this to see who it was I was talking to. He thought maybe perhaps one of my old friends. I don't know what he thought exactly. But just then a, a kind of a stout, heavier set man squeezed between him and came around and, and thrust his hand down towards Brother Branham and said, Brother Branham, he said, remember calling out the soldier boy? And, and Brother Branham was a little startled because he hadn't expected that. And he said, uh, uh, he, he said, he looked across the table, he said, did you remember Brother Eddie? I said, yes, you said, 
Hey, you'll not commit suicide, soldier boy. That's the devil talking to you. He said, yeah, that's what you said. That's what you said. And he's shaking Brother Branham's hand. He said, well, I brought them all away from Fairbanks. And we, we tried to get him into a prayer line and we weren't able to get him into a prayer line. He said, this is him. W would you pray for him? And uh, oh, sure. And just that moment, the waitress came and slid our soup in front of us. And uh, so, so Brother Brown said, well, uh, perhaps, and that was one of my first real shocking moments. I thought Brother Branham was going to stand and pray for him, cast that devil out of him, you know, because that was how I had been brought up. And Brother Branham said, well, maybe we'll just eat our soup first. And I thought, eat our soup, you know. Here, here's a soldier boy trying to commit suicide. So anyway, they said, well, that'll be fine. We need to get something to eat ourselves. And they went down two, three booths and sat in uh, to have their dinner. And then Brother Branham entered into visions and he just looked over my head and uh, began to talk about what had happened in the prayer line the day before. He said, I believe there was a blind woman that came through the service yesterday. And I said, well, I, I can't remember a blind woman. And Brother Chris Berg spoke up. He said, yeah, I believe there was a blind woman. And Brother Branham, he's, he's not really acknowledging our conversation. He's just looking over my head. And uh, he said, yes. He said, let's see. Yes, he said, oh, I understand. I see now. He said, there's a young German woman that has given up her place in the prayer line to lead the blind woman through. And then he, he looked at me. He said, you see, Brother Eddie, it may be that she's praying right now. And he, he said, uh, just a moment. And he looks away for a moment. He said, yes, she's a German woman. Just to help you believe, he said, I'll ask him and he'll give me her name. And he just looked away. He said, yes, her name is Sister Fair. In English, we would say fair, but in German, we would say fair. Sister Fair, and then he just moved his head for a little bit. He said, you see, perhaps she's praying just now. He said, she has a heart trouble. She has an, uh, two or three organs in her body, and he named them and said, she's, she may be praying just now. I asked my father if he could find this woman and my father found her. She was in a, uh, a city quite a bit south of Dawson Creek. And it would have been about 500 miles from where we were sitting. And I, I just found myself in an unusual place. And now with that soldier boy in his need, Brother Branham became under that burden. So as soon as we were finished eating, we got up to pay the bill. And Brother Branham, he's standing right in front. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let anyone pay the bill. So he's standing right in front of the cash desk. And we're, I'm standing right beside him. And the soldier boy came in and he's right behind him. And the soldier boy just tapped him on the shoulder. He said, Brother Branham, he said, just two minutes, just two minutes. Oh, sure, he said. And, uh, and, and the little doubt felt, we were all in a group there. And we walked out the door, and outside the door was a small sidewalk. It went down here, uh, would be to the left as we came out, and went down to the garbage cans. And up to the right would be where the cars were parked on the gravel access road. And so, I and Chris Berg and the little heavy set fellow who drove him down uh, went up, we, we went up there, but I faced myself so I could watch and see that Brother Branham, what he was doing, because I was very, very curious in my young heart. 
I was about 26, 27, and I'd been preaching for several years, but I was just, I, there was no such a thing as knowing the message yet. There's no such a thing. I had no knowledge of Malachi 4. I had no knowledge of Revelation, no knowledge of a messenger. I only knew that Brother Branham had a unique, the unique uh, part of his ministry was the angel of the Lord that was always there. And I thought, if that angel of the Lord is in attendance at these meetings, regardless of what anyone has said about him or said about his doctrine, I would, I would know by the presence of the angel of the Lord that he would not honor something that was not correct or true. And so as I was watching Brother Branham, I saw that he had his hat off and I knew that he was praying. And then he slipped his hat back on and both, of, both he and the soldier boy turned around and they're walking very erect towards me. The soldier boy was a bit, quite a bit taller than Brother Branham. And I thought, at that instant, I thought, now this could be a very charismatic moment and I'm not I'm gonna be swept away by the, you know, the excitement or the emotion of the moment. And that's what I had just had in my heart. But the soldier boy's face was completely transformed. He was, he was just totally relaxed. And he thrust his hand up into the air with his fist. He said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And they came up and the soldier said to me, he said, this man told me something that only I and my wife in this world know. He says, and when he did, it was gone. So we stepped into our cars and we said our farewells and I guess I understand I took a picture of them and which I'm, and this is a unique part of this ministry and a unique part of my testimony is the eternal aspect of God because here I had it on the platform. Now here we were 300 miles up the road and all I can really say is I was there on the platform. I heard him call the soldier boy out. We have it on tape. Now I'm 300 miles away. And you, you have to understand where we were standing. You probably could go 1,000 or 1,500 miles north and never see a human. You could probably go at least five, six, seven hundred miles south and never see a human down the Rocky Mountain Trench from where we were, truly a needle in a haystack. And that man had brought the soldier down for prayer from Fairbanks, Alaska, 1,523 miles on a very difficult journey actually believed, he said, I believed that we would find you. And the soldier boy spoke up and he said, that is correct. This man actually believed we would find you today. And to find two humans or three humans in that part of the world was, is more than a needle in a haystack. It just had to be sovereign, almighty God. And now he's saying his final words. While they were down praying at the garbage cans, this heavy set man was kind of nervously speaking. He said, uh, he's tried to commit suicide three times. He's been under the care of the army doctors. And he said, they can't figure out what's wrong with him. He has, he has a lovely Christian wife and two beautiful children, and they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. When we got in our cars, Brother Branham, he just on a little access road, and it was rough, and Brother Branham said to me, he said, Brother Eddie, he said, uh, 
you don't know this young man, or... I said, no, I don't really. He said, he's not a good friend of yours. I said, no, I don't know him. He said, uh, not likely you'll ever see him again. And I, I, know, I noticed that, not likely you'll ever see him again. And I said, uh, no, I said, he lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. I live in Victoria, British Columbia. Not likely we'll ever see him again. He said, now just to help you believe, he said, if, if you knew him, if he was a good friend of yours, I'd never tell you. But he said, when we got to the end of the sidewalk, he came to us there. I knew exactly what he was talking about. He came to us there and told him he had a lovely Christian wife and two beautiful children. I just heard that two, three minutes before from his friend that drove him down. And I wouldn't be telling this account to you or the world if he'd said he had a, a Christian wife and three children. But the man told me he had a lovely Christian wife and two children. Here's Brother Branham telling me he has a lovely Christian wife and two children, but he had been committing homosexual acts with young men. And as soon as he said that, he said as soon as that was uncovered, Satan lost his power and I, I learned a great truth at that moment that all Satan has to be is exposed. Once he's exposed, he's lost his power. Now here I come to a very unique part of this whole ministry. That one that was talking and speaking, he came to us there. That one who said what his problem was, that God is timeless, he's eternal. And it was 36 years later, 36 years later, a few years ago, uh, I was in my study and I came upstairs and my daughter Marilyn, our, our middle daughter, her and her husband Mike had been down to Florida and had been visiting a church. And a pastor, Brother Bob Brown, gave Marilyn a picture and said, here, give this to your dad. I think it may be Northern Canada and he might know something about it. So when I came upstairs from study, my wife said, Marilyn left a picture here for you. Brother Bob Brown sent it up. So I went to the little telephone desk and I'm, I'm holding the picture and it's the soldier boy and the man that brought him down from Fairbanks and Brother Branham standing between them and I took the picture. I couldn't remember taking the picture, but I was the only other person except Brother Chris Berg who wouldn't know how to handle the camera. And I was struck into silence. And, she, and my wife said, what is it? I couldn't seem to answer her. She said again, what is it? What is it? What is the picture? I said, it's the soldier boy. I said, I've got to call Brother Brown. So I called him and got him on the phone right away. I said, Brother Brown, where did you get this picture? He said, well, I had a young man here in the church. He was kind of a, you know, he wasn't really stable. He didn't seem to be stable. He was here and then he would be drifting someplace else. I said, is he still there? No, he said, he's not here anymore. He said, and he was working in a, with a construction company. Uh, they were building a mall and some people were in there doing the floor. And this young guy, he was always wanting to witness to somebody so he was talking to this man about Brother Branham. And he said, and the other fellow said, well, I've had my picture taken with him. And he brought him that picture. 
and Brother Branham had said to me, not likely you'll ever see him again. I tried to make contact with him, but I could not. I never have seen him since. Not since that day a week in Fort Nelson, British Columbia. And so I begin to realize On Sunday, uh, which was the next day after the soldier boy had been called out, I was once again on the platform and uh, they had a prayer line. And uh, in that prayer line came a woman, well, well known to us. She was a very dear friend of my parents. And I knew her very well. Her name was uh, Sister Clunt. Her husband, they didn't have any children that I know of. Her husband was a very stout man, and I don't know what he, uh, what he actually did for a living, but I believe he worked in the agricultural department from what we have found out since. And so she came up and she's just standing, and Brother Branham says, now here is a lady, and he begins to speak, and uh, he said, you're very nervous. Uh, he said, and you have other complications, other problems. Uh, you have, I think, a spiritual problem as well. And he begins to talk to her. He said, uh, yes, you are very nervous. He said, I see you standing by a window when the sun was setting. And you're rubbing your hands. And uh, then he stops and he's speaking to her, but he's also speaking to the congregation, speaking to people like myself. He's saying now, uh, and this, it means so much to us now. He said, now, who could do that? What man could tell you where you were standing and what you were praying? And he said, and then you prayed that God would help you to get a prayer card. And when that prayer card was given to you, you were so happy, very happy, that you'd received a prayer card. And he, he asked, you know, how, how could a man know that? He wanted the people to see that that was God and the prophet, the prophet ministry, for a prophet is a spokesman for God. It was not just a gift of discernment. It was not that. But a lot of my friends were tended to believe that it was just maybe a gift of a word of knowledge or something. It wasn't that. He was in both worlds. He was in another dimension. And he told her where she was standing, what her prayer was, and how her, her reaction when she got the prayer card. And then he said... Uh, now, he said, he will just talk to the lady. And he said, you have something else. Now, this is what was so striking to me. He said, you have something else that's on your heart. You're praying for a friend, a man that's dying with cancer. 
and they do not live, and I noticed he said they do not live because it was him and his wife. He said they do not live here, they live in Fort St. John. And I knew Fort St. John was just 50 miles up the Alaskan Highway. What Brother Branham did not know is we were going up the highway. I was taking him early the next morning, Monday morning, up the highway. And Brother Branham was preaching on, show us the Father. I thought it was so remarkable. He was actually showing the people the Father. He said, who can tell you where you were standing when you prayed? No one but Almighty God. And that you're praying for a friend. And he said, he's, he's dying with cancer. Yes, he said, he is a, a sinner. And he's dying with cancer. He mentioned it twice. And he said, uh, only believe, just believe. That seemed to be the key. He said, take that handkerchief that you have and give it to him and he'll be well. I guess she never did get it to him. This was the end of May. He passed away July the 6th, 1961. But I, of course, I didn't know that. We, we, we found that out many years later. But the next day, I'm in the car, and you have to understand, I had a lot of questions about Brother Branham, about his doctrine, about his ministry, but there was one thing that I knew, that is the angel of the Lord was in attendance with him at the platform, and now we were having a, just a profound effect upon me and other ministers and he said, he said, as we drove down the highway, we started coming to the town of Fort St. John, which laid up to the right hand of the highway. And there was an entrance into Fort St. John. When the U.S. Army cut just through the farmland, the farmhouse was just up to the right, maybe 100, 150 yards. And I had noticed that house so many times in my youth and childhood, and just a big old white farmhouse. And as Brother Branham, as we, he slowed down for the speed limit, and we're just driving slowly, he said, there was a woman that came in the prayer line yesterday praying for a man from Fort St. John. Oh, I said, Brother Branham, she's a very good friend of my parents. Her name is Sister Clunt, and I know her well. And, and I knew her, I was there on the, on the platform, and she was standing there, and he was telling her these things. Now here we are driving, and the house is just over here to my right. And he said, he just serious, he, 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 he was in a different frame of mind, you'd say. And uh, he just said, as we were driving past, the house was going by. So he swung his arm this way and pointed behind my head. He said, the man is in that house? Well, I was shocked. I was startled, but I didn't know that the man was in that house. I didn't know his name or anything. And we, we continued on the road up to Fort Nelson and beyond up to Brother Bud Southwick's place. Brother Bud Southwick was just a new, new Christian. He had been saved in my church uh, about a year before. I was so anxious to acquaint him with spiritual things. He was just, uh, he was raised horses and he rode in the, in the rodeos and things. And so he didn't know anything. He didn't know Genesis from Revelation. He just didn't know the Bible. So I wanted to acquaint him with what a prophet was. I said, when we went 
by that house. I said, Brother Branham pointed to it and said, the man is in that house. I said, you know, Sister Clunt, she was on the platform praying for him. And, and Brother Southwake, my friend, he said, oh, I know him. He's Ed, his name is Ed Thomas. I've known him ever since I've been about eight years old. And uh, so now I had it on the platform, on the highway, and with Brother Southwake. This was all within 24 hours. It was like uh, just a divine intervention of God saying, I will cause you to believe. I will bring it right in front of you. I will bring it. It was so arranged, I just could not doubt it. I guess it was the grace of God to me that was anchoring my faith, and I just couldn't. There was one day, and the next day, and the next day. And I do not know whether it was in that particular service where Brother Branham spoke, and all of the service was not taped, apparently. But anyway, I was standing, and I'll never forget this. I was standing on the platform. Right beside me, on my right-hand side, was standing Brother Paul Cornish, the pastor in the church in Grand Prairie. And he was, he was just standing there. He was, a very, he was taller than I was, he was very dignified, very scholarly, and uh, a man that didn't show a lot of emotion, but he was standing there, and Brother Branham was facing, uh, not facing us, he had his back to us, and to the prayer line was going down the wall this time, and up this way. And uh, while we were just standing there, Brother Branham, I can't explain this, this is so strange but he just lifted his head this way and cried out, the boy will be all right. And uh, a force went by me. It was like a wind, but it wasn't a wind. It was just a power, a force. Just went by me, but I was conscious of it. And, and I was bewildered. I don't know, what's happening? The boy will be all right. And Paul Cornish, brother Paul Cornish, collapses over and is in convulsing tears. And I don't know what's happening. Here he's, the voice, the force, is so, so unusual while he's just talking to somebody in front of him. And, uh, and, and here's Brother Paul Cornish. What do you do when somebody's, you know, crying and convulsing? I didn't know whether to pray with him or what to do. Then he straightened up after he collected himself, he nudged me and he said, Brother Eddie, he said, you see down the prayer line towards the end, he said, young lad that's standing there, he said, that's my son and he's up for a serious operation next week. And to have, to have those kind of things, I, I just became aware of another realm. I became aware of another place, another dimension. This man was not just ministering to the people, but it was like he was, he was in contact with another world. The boy will be all right, and he just continues on. And uh, I, I don't know anything of the lad, or what happened after that, but I, that was just a very, very strange and very unusual event uh, for me.
I was in my home in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, when I received a phone call from Brother Branham, and he was saying that I believe we're going to have a good hunt. Uh, Brother Eddie, we're going to have a good hunt. I had a dream or a vision, and he began to tell me a little bit about it and uh, said that he would give me the full details when we met. So when we met in Dawson Creek, he said, I had this dream or vision. He said, if it was a vision, it'll happen exactly like that. And in the vision, he said, there were two or three small fellows on the hunt. I had arranged the hunt, and there was only three of us, including Brother Branham, Brother Bud Southwick, Brother Branham, and myself. We were the three. Brother Southwick's son, Blaine, was not able to go on the hunt because he was in the far north in the Arctic uh, on a survey crew and would not be able to be back for the hunt. Well, uh, so I thought, well, maybe it was just a dream. I don't know. But he, Brother Branham said, we saw, I saw this large animal and its horns kind of went back on its head. And I said, oh, that may be a caribou. He said, well, I don't know. I haven't seen a caribou before. But he said, this was a dark chocolate brown animal. I said, no. I said, caribou are uh, like battleship gray. And he said, well, no, this was chocolate brown. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't stray from that description at all. It was a dark chocolate brown animal. So then uh, he said, uh, there was, uh, in this, in this vision or dream, I saw uh, one of the young men, his hands were like this, he said, and they were spread out. He said there was no hair on the arms, on the hands. He said, I would say, and he kind of stopped like that, looked up, he said, probably about 18, 18 years old. Now, I would like to encourage the viewers to be real attentive to the details because this vision was six hours in the fulfillment. And uh, he said, one of, my, one of my buddies was in a, a green checkered shirt. Well, I had had a green checkered shirt and I had told my wife to, before the hunt, I said, just throw that away because it had been torn and sewn several times around here on the pocket. My husband was going hunting. He had this pretty good shirt, green checkered shirt, but it, had, it was torn around the pocket and I had mended it several times. And he said, go and get me another shirt. It was a nice shirt doe skin, soft, nice hunting shirt. And I said, okay. But I just didn't have time. I didn't have a car. I had the little girls. You have to take a bus into town. So I mended it again the best I could. And I put it into his duffel bag. And away he went. When we got up to Dawson Creek, I asked Brother Branham, if he would tell the vision to my father. So he related the whole vision that this dark chocolate brown animal and he had gotten that animal and had gotten another, uh, a grizzly bear at the same time. And for me, that was a shock. I thought I had lived in the North. I had never gotten a grizzly bear myself. And I thought that was outstanding. And then we journeyed on the way up the Alaskan Highway to Brother Bud Southwick's place. And when we drove into the yard, here all the children came out, and including Blaine, his son, who was supposed to be in the Arctic. And I said, well, you're Blaine. I thought you were away up and you wouldn't be able to go on this hunt. Well, he said he just came back a couple of days ago. And I asked Brother Southwick, Will Blaine be able to come on the hunt? Well, yeah, he thought he better come on the hunt with us. So suddenly now I saw that we were two or three little fellows 
on the trip. And uh, Blaine was fixing a little harness on the side of one of the buildings. And I was standing there with him, just the two of us, and I asked him, I said, Blaine, how old are you? He said, 18, why? I said, well, I was just curious to know. Now we had a young fellow and he was 18 years old and myself and when Brother Branham was giving the vision, I asked him to tell Brother Southwick and his family at the supper table, tell them about the vision. So he got to the dark chocolate brown animal. I said, Brother Bud, I always thought that caribou was a dark uh, battleship gray. Well, he said, you know, that is strange. He said, all, every caribou that I've seen on the north side of the highway, the Alaskan highway, has been a kind of a battleship gray, and he used the same words. He said, and they are a bush caribou, and all the caribou on the south side and the west of the highway has been a mountain caribou, and they're kind of a dark chocolate brown color. And I said, well, where are we going? He said, well, we're going on the south side of the highway. So things were coming together, and I, there was more weight to it being a vision than it being a dream. And I, the only thing was a young man with a chocolate, or with a checkered shirt, and when we got up to make our camp, we made our camp and way down the valley, it would be to my right, we saw that on the skyline, there were a few caribou and some mountain sheep. And so Brother Southwick said, well, tomorrow I think that we should probably go up there. It was probably two or three miles. And uh, so the next day, we made our way up there and we got up on the ridge and uh, we ran into a few caribou and they scattered and one ran down this way. And so I went on my, we all split up and Blaine went one direction and Brother Branham and Bud went another direction and I went one direction and I found a young caribou and I, I was needing meat and I shot that caribou and it was just dark chocolate brown. And so Blaine came by and we dressed that caribou out and then we went back and met together and then we climbed up on a mountain ridge and Brother Branham said, on this, in this vision, there was a great panoramic, and he moved his arm this way. And he said, on this great panoramic, and then he says, my friend in the checkered shirt was way down this way towards camp, and camp was two, three miles this direction. And he said he was waiting there, and on the way there, uh, he said, I got this large caribou, dark chocolate brown. And he said, on the way then, we saw a grizzly bear on the mountain. And God gave me that animal in one shot. And I was just kind of speechless. And uh, then while the vision was being fulfilled, we sat on this ridge and I just looked at this beautiful panoramic. I can say that I wasn't really conscious of every detail of the vision, but it, it was just, we were caught up in the, in the beauty of the moment and the great mountain peaks on this side, on the left side, and spurring off onto our ridges, and we were ate our lunch on this one ridge, and Brother Branham said, what is that over there, Brother Bud? and uh, he took his binoculars. There was two great caribou animals, bulls, laying on a mountain glacier. I think laying on a glacier because there's less bugs and they're, it's very nice and cool. And they were laying there, kind of sleeping, I think. 
And so Brother Bud laid out a plan. He said, well, Blaine, he said, why don't you take Brother Eddie and take the horses and go and get his meat and then journey down this way to this dry creek bed and wait for us and we'll come down and meet you. So I suggested that we wait till we see if they got this animal, which in about another half hour they did. And I came up over the ridge and got this large uh, caribou bull animal. And so then we went and got my meat and we journeyed down here to this dry creek bed towards camp. What was strange that morning when we had just left the tent, I fell into a creek and I got my clothes wet. And I said to the brothers, just wait here and I will run home. I'll run back to the tent, which was a short, very short distance. And I, I, and I opened up my duffel bag and there was this green checkered shirt. And when you got up hunting and had that little mishap in the water, and had to go back to the tent and open up his bag and there was the green checkered shirt. And he said, I told Ruth to get me a new shirt and she didn't do it. But I didn't know that it was all a part of the vision. You just do things without even thinking that there's anything spiritual tied to it. And I put it on and that's the shirt I had. I had a green checker shirt. The vision and all of the details, just, uh, it was not in my mind whatsoever. I was cold and wet and I changed and, and uh, then I ran up to catch up with the other brothers and away we went. So when we went down to this dry creek bed, I had on that checkered shirt. We waited, Blaine and I, we waited for about half an hour to an hour. And Blaine said, if they're not here in about another half hour, he said, I'm gonna go and find them. And in the vision, I was alone waiting for them. In another half hour, they still weren't there. He said, so I'm gonna go and see if I can meet up with them because we didn't know what had happened. Uh, we didn't know whether we missed them somehow or whatever. So he leaves and now I'm waiting alone. And I was waiting about another half hour. And then I heard some voices and I just took a few steps to the trail and here came Brother Bud carrying this big caribou on his head, on his shoulders rather. We come all the way down that creek bottom packing that caribou cape and head and on the, and he kept a watching for this this grizzly well you, you know it was like looking on the side of that hill up there only you wanted that bush up on it you know just that short grass and there was just no bear there that's all and all all at once well we were getting far near to where you guys was and and I'd give give it up, really, to seeing a, a grizzly. You know, and finally, we were sitting down resting again, and he pointed up there on the side of the hill, and he said, "What? What's that up there?" Well, he knew what it was. <laughs> I did. <laughs> as soon as I glimpsed up there, I knew it was a bear. So I said, you know, and it was a silver tip and it was about the same color as an old Rome milk cow that I had and I said, man, oh, my sure looks like my own milk cow. <laughs> yeah, and up, up we went. When he said he would shoot it, you know, it was, to me it was like him shooting from here up to the top of that cliff up there, better, better than that. I had no idea he'd, he would shoot that far and I, I, I wouldn't have let anybody else shoot that far anyway, you know, they could have crippled something there and all. But, but we had no time to, to go around and come up from the back of that mountain. It took us a day. And so I said to him, I said, we'll have to let the, that bear go tonight and 
come back after him tomorrow. But we can't get, can't get any closer this way. He's looking right down at us. And, oh, he said, I, I can kill him from here, he said. And I doubted that, really, because I hadn't seen him, you know, shoot that much. That caribou was right on top of that when he shot that. <coughs> Boy, when he shot, that old bear just was coming. He he pulled that gun up and it snapped. Man, <clears throat> my hair stood right up. That was after the first shot. Yeah. That bear was coming. He fell. Oh, for me, that big big poplar over there from us, like and right even with us like that too. He fell in that short chain thing you there. I said, you watch him and I'll go over and see how dead he is. <clears throat> so he did. But he was dead as could be. He fell. And another thing he said, he said that it going to be too late. We wouldn't uh, skin that bear out that night. Well, I never dreamt of, you know, leaving a trophy overnight. Another old bear could have come along and tore that all to pieces, but that's the first thing we thought about, you know, leave it, leave it till tomorrow. Every every word that he said comes just as true as true could be the path. And you know, and you never even thought about it at the time, but you get thinking of it afterwards. I ran up to Brother Branham. Brother Branham was standing there. I said, I put my hand out to shake his hand. I said, congratulations, Brother Branham. That's, that's a lovely animal. And he said, uh, I got a bear too. And I just tapped him on the shoulder. I said, oh, you didn't get a bear the same day. He said, yeah, I did. And I, I felt strange. I said, well, where is it? And Bud said, well, we're not able to carry it. He said, the hide would probably wear three, weigh 300 pounds. And I said, well, and I felt real strange. And Bud walked over to his saddle horse, which was right there, and went into the saddle bag and brought out a little round tape with a push button on the side. And I was kind of amused. I had lived in the wilderness all my life and had hunted and never saw anybody carry a tape. And then I thought, well, he's a guide now. Probably he's interested in, you know, the size of the horns, etc. And he brought out this little steel tape and he put it right down at the base of the horns. There's a little ridge there. And he hooked the tape there and then the tape went into this curve and then around. And every time he started to go around, the bottom flicked out. And then it, so he started it again and followed it around, trying to measure it correctly and it flicked out about the third time he says to his son, Blaine, hold that tape in there. And so Blaine knelt down on one knee and spread his hands out. 18 year old boy. And then I, I begin to feel real strange. Held his hands out and Brother Bud pulled the tape around. And Brother Branham said in the vision, he just heard a voice saying, it's 42 inches. And that was it. And I, I put my head, Blaine looked up while he was holding the tape. Brother Bud, he held his head over the tape to make sure where the black line and the black line of 42 inches fell at the last point of the horn. And he said, it's 42 inches. And I, I just felt overwhelmed. And Brother Branham, he did not look. He just stood there erect, and I was right on his shoulder. And he just said, he said, there it is. It was all over. And the grizzly was laying up on the mountain, and there, there the horn was, and the vision was over. That took about six hours in total for the whole vision. A dark chocolate brown animal, 
and uh, I'm standing there in a green checkered shirt and uh, the vision was completely fulfilled. And I can say to all who hear, this is a true report. Everything is true, absolutely true. like to tell you of some native Indian people that were down here at the coast of on British Columbia on Vancouver Island there was a the chief of Uklulet tribe his name was Jack Patrick he was a Christian I lived in his house when I went to go up there for meetings and his wife and his uncle who became a very dear friend of mine, Albert Jackson and his wife. The four of them had brought a, a sister up. Once again, this event actually spans many years, but yet the actual event which I'm relating happened in these meetings and they came up for the meetings because I had spoken of arranging these meetings in Grand Prairie and Dawson Creek. So they drove the 800 miles up to Dawson Creek and then found out that the first meetings were in Grand Prairie. They almost came back, which would have been a great disappointment to me. They had a woman with them that was dying with cancer. And she had a terrible issue of blood. I, I don't know much about it, except I was to find out. And in the years that followed, and uh, Brother Branham called her out and told her to stand. She wasn't strong enough to stand. And he called her out and said that she would be healed or whatever more, I don't know, to have faith. And the native Indian people had a very simple faith. And they were staying in a motel. They told me that that night they were in the motel and in the middle of the night at some time she became violently ill. I think Sister Albert Jackson went with her to the washroom and she passed a large cancer. Many years later, now this is the other aspect, many years later, we had moved to Toronto. We're in Toronto for several years, moved back here to Surrey, and now had the meetings and a church here. A woman, a native Indian woman from Port Alberni, who was in the meetings, her name is Agnes Dick. She came over to our church here in Surrey and was here in the house 
we had meetings in the house and she was in the meetings in the house just once in all the years we've been here she was just there once and this was many years after 1961 it probably was at least 1972 73 so 10 11 12 years later she was came to Vancouver because she was in the medical field and nursing or something. And she took a special course there and came out here and saw us just once. And that's why I like to be able to convey to you, I was there. I was in the meetings. I had arranged the meetings. I knew the people. Chief Jack Patrick, his wife, Albert Jackson, his wife. And now Sister Agnes Dick comes over and spends one service with us. And after the service, I was telling her about this. She said, they stopped at my home on the way up. And she said, they spent the night. And she said, the woman was issuing blood and so on so badly it soaked through she said I had to put sheets under her and it soaked through into the mattress and I told them do not take her she will not make the journey she will not be she will not live for that journey that long journey to Dawson Creek and Fort and Grand Prairie and she said she, was, she got healed and she's still living today. And that was many years later, 10, 12, 15 years later, and she's still living today. I think that I should say something was, something registered in the hearts of the native people. Sister Agnes Dick, when I had been when I had been there, living there on Vancouver Island, which was some years before this woman was healed. And I had a unique experience with this Albert Jackson. He was a very, very, very elderly man and had a real scowly looking face, just like a great storm and I, I thought that he was angry with me. The first time I met him, I thought he was very angry with me. I preached, but now a short time later, here we are having a meeting in Port Alberni, which is probably 50, 60 miles from Euclid. And he came to me because we had this very close connection. He could not speak English well. So he said to me, he said, I was to preach in a longhouse and there was about 300 people there. And so he, Albert Jackson said, uh, a full you, a full you, that's before you. A full you speak, I speak. I said, okay, brother Albert, before I speak, you wanna speak. <laughs> A full you, I speak. Okay. I said, that's fine. So before I got up and spoke, and I remember what I spoke on. I spoke on the midnight hour and the workers and the laborers that were called at the different times. And I said, it's very, very late. And he got up and spoke in his native tongue. All I noticed was all the children were lined up on a little bench on blocks of wood. And they were just sitting, he, they were transfixed with him as he spoke in his native tongue. This sister Agnes Dick, that I just talked about, got up after and she came to the front and she said, I don't think I could ever be the same again. She said, I know that Brother Biscoll doesn't know anything of our language. And I know that Albert Jackson doesn't know anything of English. And he gets up and speaks to us in our native tongue. 
and Brother Biscold gets up and speaks in English, and they both said almost the same thing word for word. And she said, I can never be the same. So there were supernatural things that were happening at that time. But here, maybe 20, 30 years later, is a network. And a woman is healed from cancer. And then they are affected by our lives and our ministry. And when it comes down to it, Sister Agnes Dick passing, her husband calls, he's 82 years old then, has his grandchildren call Brother Eddie Biscoll many years, and I go back to Port Alberni and there. So we have a, a very, very unique connection. And all I can say is they're caught in a, in a web of supernatural things that were happening. So I would like to say, the supernatural God that was calling the woman to stand, the supernatural God that healed her from cancer, the supernatural God that kept her alive for many years, and then to have the same supernatural God call us to come over and give testimony and to speak and to sing and to give testimony once again so that they would know the God that was demonstrating himself on the platform was the same God. We lived in Victoria, and uh, I got a call from my brother saying that my dad had had uh, a massive heart attack. The main artery of, to his heart had ruptured out, and he was just hanging on a thread. And uh, in those days, they had oxygen tents where they put them over you. So my husband called the doctor in Dawson Creek, and the doctor said, you'd better send her up. So it was about a two-hour flight, I guess, up to Dawson. So I went up, and uh, I was only able to stand by his bed for 10 minutes and at a day and not, not speak to him. He couldn't speak, of course. And I was there for two or three days, and then I had to come back because we were now preparing for Brother Branham's meetings. I was very burdened for him. My heart was very heavy. And we went into the Alberni meetings with that on my heart, wanting to speak to Brother Branham and ask him to pray for him. But I didn't have a chance because I was playing the piano. And then we came down to Victoria and had the meetings there. And uh, the meetings closed, and Brother Ed was speaking to Brother Branham and just uh, saying goodbye to him. 
and we stood outside the motel and it was evening, late evening, and they were just saying goodbye in a very casual way. And then he just turned and said, oh, by the way, Sister Piscal, your father will be all right. And from then on, he recovered. And uh, I think he was about 64 when he had that attack. And from then on, he had no trouble with his heart, not one minute. And he lived just a month from 85, and he passed away just from old age, no trouble with his heart whatsoever. And when Brother Branham said he'll be all right, he was all right. And he, he confessed, he said, I know I'm saved. In Alberni, I was in the meetings there when Brother Brown was there and hearing him call out the Native Indian people that I knew and I knew their situations. I don't know if he told about this one uh, brother, his name was Mike and he was sitting right up probably in the second row from the front and everybody knew about an older man who was from a little fishing village called Ahauset. He had been an invalid, just laying on a cot for years. And, uh, and Brother Branham said to this Brother Mike, you're praying for this man, and he's an invalid, and he's in a hospital not far from here in a city called Nanaimo. Well, Brother Ed knew that this brother was from Ahauset. So in his mind, he said, no, this brother is not in Nanaimo, he's in Ahauset. And another brother on the platform said, no, this brother is not in Nanaimo, he's in Alberni in a hospital. And afterwards they found out, yes, he had been moved that very day up to the Indian hospital in Nanaimo. And Brother Branham had said, he's in Nanaimo. Brother Robert Johnson um, took Brother Branham out in his boat. This is in the Alberni area. And it was out on the Alberni Canal. And uh, Brother Johnson and his wife were unable to have children, and they had prayed about having a child. And uh, as they were going along in the boat, uh, suddenly they thought they had hit a log, what they call a deadhead. It's a floating log just below the surface. Very dangerous to, to boats if they hit that. And, and uh, Brother Branham said to Brother Johnson, you thought, you, you thought you hit a deadhead. That was the presence of the Lord letting you know that he's going to give you and your wife a child. We lived with the native people at Euclid. We stayed in their house. I wouldn't even want to tell you the conditions of things that we saw, but you know, that's the way it is. You know, when you, when you won't, don't want to put your elbows on the table because you know they're going to stick there, you know, and little kids running around without diapers or anything else, you know, and there's no plumbing, there's no running water. There's, at one, at one house we stayed in, there's, they gave us the room with the bed. And up one corner of the room goes a stairway that goes upstairs. And between the steps, it's all open. So they gave us the room with the curtain across the door. So we get into the bed, and at every step, there's a little kid looking through the, you know, through the stairs. Yeah. And there was 18 of us in that house. So, but I don't know, 
you look back on it and I love those people. I want to, I like to go back. Yeah. And we saw some wonderful things take place. We saw, we know one woman that at one point drunk, crawling on her hands and knees along the muddy path to the, to get to her house, you know. And then the next thing we saw her, she's just wonderfully saved and transformed and you just, you just rejoice over those things. Yeah, the change that you see in these people. Only God can do it. Drunks, one brother we know, he, he got on the ferry to Victoria and go to, he was drunk when he got on the ferry over to, from point A to point B. Drunk when he came back, drunk when he walked to his house on the reserve and his little kid comes up to him and says, Daddy, listen to what I heard today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that man was saved, transformed, right there from that scripture. A wonderful believer. So, yeah, it's good. Coming home the other night, or the other day, or just before I come home, I was fell into a vision, and I seen some little fellas, thin, looked like young boys or something, had on caps, and we were standing hunting, and I'd shot a mammoth, big brown looking bear, and then they turned around and said to me, said, um, but there's some confusion about the meeting, and I said, no matter what the confusion is, if I supposed to go wherever it was, I'll go anyhow. See, it doesn't matter. And the vision stopped. I don't know where that's at, but this is on tape. It's going to happen. Just remember, it's going to happen. It's a vision. On one of the trips, uh, we had just arrived and made camp. And uh, Brother, Brother Southwick said, Blaine, why don't you and Billy Paul and Brother Ed... Uh, go this direction, and uh, I and Brother Branham will, will, will go up the mountain just behind us here. And I think that he wanted to do that because on the first day of the hunt, he wanted to uh, be, take Brother Branham a little bit easier, and he wanted it a little easier for himself as well because he had you know, suffered a wee bit with angina. So they were going to take it easier, and we made our way uh, down the valley and then up into another little valley. And we just climbed up on a bench, and there was a giant bear coming down the other side of this valley, not far from us. And he was making his way, and we kind of positioned ourselves behind some willows. 
I never saw a bear like this before or since. And he was quite dark, very large, and right from behind his ears and over, over his hump and down his, down his cape, down his breast, like so. He was just the color of golden wheat. I never saw a bear like that. It was the most magnificent thing and large and he was turning over stones and looking for ants and things and maybe rodents and so on and he was making his way down and, and I know that grizzlies are very poor sighted but their hearing and, and especially their smell is so accurate. We don't know that world at all, but God has given them that. And he, when he walked out to the, where the hills turned into this valley, and he just across from us, and Billy Paul and Brother Blaine and myself, we got down in the willows. There were just small willows there. And we were watching this bear, and he came down, and he was across from us. He was probably four, five, six hundred yards across the mouth of this little valley. It was a, started like a wash from a basin. And uh, we were watching him, and uh, the other brothers thought I should try a shot at it. And I said, no, I wouldn't do that. I said, Brother Branham hasn't fired a shot yet that I know of. I said, I, I wouldn't want to do that. We didn't know, and had not connected it with the a vision Brother Branham had had of a large, big, brown bear, and this was him. And we watched him for probably half an hour. And then I saw that bear, and he just put that giant head up into the uh, air and the wind, and he, uh, he, was, he tossed his head back and forth, and he was trying to get our scent. And then he just went like this and looked straight across the valley at us. And then he wheeled around and started on a gallop and he ran straight up this mountain. I timed him. It was probably 10, 12 minutes. And he went right, right over the top of this mountain, up into the glacier and his big paws, and we were watching in the glasses, and he ran right over the top of this mountain and disappeared. That day, our brother Billy Paul had gotten a caribou, and I also got a caribou later in the afternoon. And the next day was just a cloudy, stormy weather, and it rained and it was cold. And that night, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, four days, we were locked into the tent. And I heard Brother Southwick, he kind of came by because I was kind of the point man and arranged the hunts and bought the food and got things, you know, organized for the hunt. And uh, so, he kind of, he just came by me, he said, I think Brother Branham wants to go home. Oh, I said, you know, that was a shock to me. I couldn't believe that he wanted to go home. We hadn't really started the hunt in earnest. So I said to Brother Branham, I, I said, Brother Branham, do you, do you want to go home? Oh, he said, we've had a wonderful hunt. I said, but you haven't even fired a shot. He said, well, that means I can come back next year. And uh, he took it so nicely, and, and I felt, I felt kind of downhearted that to me it hadn't been completed. And uh, it was raining and cloudy, and the clouds were hanging low, and it was cold. It was just very miserable weather. So Bud started to pack up things and make ready to go. And it was, uh, I was feeling quite downcast. And we had the horses outside and now starting to put the panniers on them. And this is quite a lengthy process. 
probably take two and a half, three hours. And uh, I was outside with my horse and Brother Brenham, he came up and he said, Brother Eddie, where was it that you saw that bear? And I said, well, I pointed down the valley. I said, it's right down here. And where those, that little uh, valley comes in to this one, I said, it was, you just turn left and you go right up in there. And he was right on the bench of the mountain. And he said, uh, uh, how, how, long, how long are we going to be? So we asked Bud, how long are we going to be? Oh, he said, you have lots of time. You just take your time and go and, and uh, you know, you've got a lot of time, probably a couple of hours yet. So Brother Branham just disappeared in the little short willows and he was gone and, and Brother Bud carried on and I was standing with my horse and we were in our rain gear and this was really remarkable. And then finally I got on my horse and I was sitting on my horse and Brother Branham about an hour and a half or two hours later he came out. He, he'd been out, at, he'd actually been alone with God I believe. And he came out and he uh, came up right beside my horse. And this is what happened to me. This is what I heard and this is my testimony. And he said, put his finger up. He said, this is on account of me. He, he said, and some people might be offended with this, but this is what he said. I'm the Jonah in this group. He said, I knew I should have been with you little fellows. He said, it's the only time I know that I've disobeyed a vision, only twice. Only twice that I've known I've disobeyed a vision. And he said, uh, like this was the second time. And he said, uh, but he said, this is over and we'll ride out of here dry. Dry. The leaves on the bushes were just laden with rain and wet. And if you just went a, a few meters, a few yards into the woods, because there were short willows, but if you, you would just go a few yards, you'd be soaking wet. And I was just, I was bewildered. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to respond. And I just sat there. And I was sitting there about maybe 10 minutes and pondering the words that I've just heard. But we'll dry, we'll ride out of here dry. It's over. He said, it's over, and we'll ride out of here dry. So all I knew is that whatever uh, disappointment there was, or he'd settled something with God, or whatever, I wasn't questioning. I didn't try to figure things out. I just knew it was over. And in about 10 minutes, not more than 10, 12, 15 minutes at the most, there was a puff of air, warm air, that just kind of blew by, by me, and I thought, boy, that was nice. That was nice, warm air. And I, we hadn't felt that for a number of days, and just a little puff of air. And then, a little while later, there was a little breeze, and the leaves were shaking. And I noticed uh, probably 20, 30 yards or meters in front of me, uh, a sun, the sun was shining, just a big round spot where the sun was shining. I thought, well, I, I looked up, and there was a hole in the sky, and I was looking at blue sky, and the sun was shining straight through there on the ground, and. A little warm breeze was just like a Hawaiian breeze was blowing, just a lovely little breeze. And the leaves were shaking and, and before our horses took the first step, 
It was hot sunshine. I took off the rain gear that I had on and we rode out of there in our shirt sleeves and it was very warm weather. And we rode all the way home about eight hours in the perfect sunshine and just a lovely day. You couldn't have had a more picture perfect day than that day. And we just rode out dry. Now, I want to say to the viewers, if we'd rode out wet, you wouldn't be hearing this testimony. We rode out dry. That's what he said, and that's exactly what happened. And I want to give all the glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. The people, and many people, don't understand. Some don't think, well, it's not fulfilled, etc. I would like to, I have a couple of slides here that we'd like to refer to, and I'd like to quote. This is in September 1962, after the hunt, and it's in the message countdown. Brother Branham says, so I, in these 30, going on 32 years of ministry, I have tried to stay true to that. I don't know one thing I've ever had to alter on because I just read it out of the Bible, said just what the Bible says, and let it go like that. And so I haven't had to take back or rearrange because I just said it the way that the Bible says it. And I find out if God has spoken anything, then we must go with that word in order to make it be fulfilled. Amen. We've seen that, as I told you last night, I have a vision just recently, see, that it, I had to be there and warning to be there and telling me six months before to be on that spot and standing there and saying, go down there three times with them. And I just walked on with the other man and the vision passed right through exactly God's part. I was left standing. So we want to remember, you've got to stay on the Word. Stay right with the Word. Where the Word leads, you go right with the Word. And it'll bring out all right. It'll bring you sure. out all right, I'm sure. And uh, that, that, for my part, is the absolute solution and to the vision. Uh, I, I'm just sorry that a lot of people either don't ask their pastors or they don't research it in the message. And then some just speak presumptuously that's without authority of any kind. They don't have any supernatural authority. They don't have the attendance of the angel of the Lord. And they go and say that Brother Branham spoke presumptuously. Well, I can, I can declare he did not. He spoke with great authority and great clarity. And furthermore, I was right there. It never belittled or diminished him when he said, this is on account of me. It never occurred to me that, that it made less of him. I always thought it was great. It was greater that he could actually say it. This is on account of me. I mean, uh, I didn't want to be selfish, but the fact that we rode out dry and the weather changed, I thought, what kind of man is this? You know, that speaks to the wind and the waves and speaks to the storm and the clouds. And what is this? What's God doing for me? You know, I always thought that it was just beyond, uh, beyond what was almost necessary. You know, that we, that we, that I, I, I would be privileged to experience that. And here I, it, it baffled me that people would find that as a reason to disbelieve. I thought, what in the world is going through their minds? I just, I can't even understand it today. I just can't understand it. He just lived, lived, and lived the full life of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, whether it was, whether it was in honor or whether he was admitting that he wasn't standing where he should be, as he said in the message, and he told it right publicly to the people. And you have to be standing where you, standing with the word, if it's to be fulfilled, and then it'll be all right.